I will tell you what is so amazing to me about Tristan's story, and he's going to get really embarrassed as I talk about him, and which makes me happy. So uh, Tristan is 14 years old, and what we have been able to watch as you know his church family and also his family is just the incredible change that God is doing in his life. And that's happening because Tristan, and he is working on this process of discipleship. He is moving from decided to discipled and he is growing in crazy ways. And it's just, it's really neat to see. And so I hope it serves as an encouragement to you as you know, we work through this series about discipleship. Let it be a reminder, man, it's never too early to start. It's never too late to start. No matter where you are in life, we can grow and change to be disciples of Jesus. And so y'all just give Tristan one more hand of applause for me. He's shaking his head at me as I do that to him. Uh, but well, let me get started this morning by asking you a question. Anybody here ever work on older cars? Okay, a couple of you in the room. Last summer, Hannah and I had an emergency, my wife, where uh, we needed to buy a new car. And we had about $4,000 to work with at the time. And so trying to figure out what we were going to do. And ultimately, after some research, we came to a decision that we were going to get an older Toyota Sequoia. Now, these are big SUVs, and I'd done some research in them and found that if you got one and can get it into good shape and running well, that, like they'll go for hundreds of thousands of miles. I mean, like four, five, six hundred thousand 600,000 miles. And I was like, that's what I want. And so we did some research, started looking around, and after a little while, we ended up buying a 2003 model. Now, I did not find one in tip-top shape. In fact, I found one quite the opposite of that. Uh, the car was far from perfect condition. I'm talking, it had faded paint, it had linking suspicion parts in it, it had a leaking steering rack, it was the struts and the shocks were blown on it. I could pull my door panel off if I, if I pulled it hard enough. And when I actually first got the car, the guy was like, just roll the window down and open it from the outside. It's easier that way. And so this car, man, it could get you from A to B at that point, but not legally. And if we're being honest, not safely. But this car was now mine. And so it became my job. As soon as I got it, I was like, all right, now I got to get this thing into running and good condition. And the problem with that is I have never worked on a car in my day in my life. I had no idea what I was doing. I had never even thought about that before. And so I was faced with two options in the moment. I could do nothing and I could pay a shop thousands of dollars to just start blindly replacing parts or I could study the tools and techniques to work on it and I could learn what my car needed and actually begin to work on it myself. So I chose to study. And y'all, that summer, I mean, I watched video after video. I read article after article. I dug into intricate wiring diagrams that no man ever needs to see. And after all of my research and study, I can confidently tell you that I'm still an amateur when it comes to cars. But... I'm learning how to work on my car and getting better at it every single day. Well, we're continuing our sermon series, Beyond Belief, this morning. And what we're doing is we're taking five weeks to talk about the journey of discipleship. And the goal of this series really is to get back to the basics, right? To talk about simple concepts and talk about how we can practically grow to become disciples of Jesus. And so as we've been doing this, we're going to talk often about the process of discipleship. And this is also known as a word called sanctification. And this word comes from the Greek word hagiasmos, which means to be made holy or specifically to be set apart for special use. Now, if you were here for the last series or been here for what we've walked through so far in our current series, we've talked about this process of sanctification as moving from decided to discipled. See, the reality is, is that being a disciple of Jesus should change everything about your life. And so if you're living out a relationship with Jesus as a disciple, eventually over time, you should start to think like Jesus, talk like Jesus, and act like Jesus. Now, there is no magic formula for sudden overnight success to just all of a sudden look and live like Jesus. But what we do know is that there are five areas of growth that Jesus and other writers in the New Testament talked about that are kind of the basics and the crucial foundations of being a disciple. And this is what they are. Consistent prayer, generosity with time and talents, generosity with resources, making and growing disciples, and Bible knowledge. Now, last week we talked about consistent prayer, and this morning we're going to talk about Bible knowledge. You know, for many of you in the room, Studying about the Bible may be kind of like working on an old car. You feel like it's confusing. You don't really know where to start. Maybe you even feel like parts of it are a little outdated. And so you find yourself in the same position that I did when I first started working on my Sequoia. 
You wanted to work on it. You just didn't really know what to do about it. And so the good news for you this morning is that studying the Bible doesn't have to be this great mystery to you, but we can actually learn how to approach it. And if you have the right tools ready as you work, you'll find that studying the Bible can be something you not only understand, but can actually enjoy and apply to your life. So let's get started this morning. If you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can open those up to 2 Timothy 3, and we're going to look at verses 14 to 7, through 17 to start out this morning. And Paul says this, he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know from those you have learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through Christ Jesus. See, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, the book of 2 Timothy is actually the second recorded letter we have that Paul wrote to Timothy, who was his protege. So Paul spent a long time in his life teaching, mentoring, and discipling Timothy to be a follower and disciple of Christ. And at this point in Paul's life, he's been in prison for a while, and he's nearing the end of his life. He's about to die, and he knows this. And so 2 Timothy, when he writes this letter to him, it's really meant to be kind of his farewell to Timothy. And so he also uses it as an opportunity to share some last teachings and wisdom with his protege. Now, what you may not know about Timothy is that Timothy was actually a dynamic preacher and an incredibly wise and mature follower of Christ. In Philippians 2, Paul specifically says of Timothy that he has no one else like him. That Timothy, he is no slouch, no beginner Christian, right? If Paul is like the Tom Brady of Christianity, right, the greatest of all time, then Timothy is kind of like the, um, the Patrick Mahomes, right? He's, he's younger, but he's doing great things. And yet, given Timothy's incredible resume as a follower of Christ, Paul's last charge to Timothy goes right back to the basics. Paul tells him, he says, look, more than anything I taught you, more than anything you learned from me, if you want to know what it looks like to live as a disciple of Jesus, Paul says, remember the scriptures. Study them, know them, and use them. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about the same thing. And I want to focus in on the last two verses that Paul wrote to Timothy, verses 16 through 17. Paul says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful. Now, we need to understand that the Bible is not just a collection of stories that are thousands of years old. The Bible is not just this book that's full of motivational speeches or tales of adventure meant to simply inspire us in our life. But we need to understand that the Bible is God's revelation. It is his very words put to pen and paper. The writer of Hebrews would describe God's word as alive and active and that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it is good, it is true, and it's powerful. And so if you want to live as a disciple of Christ, if you want to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus and live this out, Paul would say, study scripture because it's God's word. It is God breathed and it's useful. Some of you in this room are new to Christianity or maybe you're simply new to this journey of discipleship. But then maybe some of you in this room and you've been Christians for a long time. You're more mature in your faith. You've studied the Bible before. You know about it. You've learned about it. But no matter where you are in your journey of discipleship this morning, I want to challenge you the same way that Paul challenges the superstar Timothy here. Remember the scriptures. Study them. Know them. Meditate on them. And apply them to your life. And I'll promise you that if you'll do that, if you can study scripture and live it out, and it'll change everything for you. It will be fruitful. God says this in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. He says, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that comes from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So 
If we look at this and can understand that Paul says that scripture is God-breathed and useful, then we can understand that God's word was given to us for the purpose of helping us grow as disciples of Jesus. And God makes a promise here that when it comes to his word, it never returns empty, it never returns void. And so what that means for us is that we have a direct promise from God that if we will study his word, learn about it and apply it to our lives, it will not be wasted effort. God says that it will be fruitful, and that means that he will grow you to look more like Jesus every single day as you live out this process of discipleship. So, if this morning you are new to studying scripture, my goal this morning is that you would leave with helpful and useful tools that would help you learn about God's word and teach you what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you consider yourself more of like a seasoned veteran when it comes to scripture, my goal is still the same. The goal this morning of this message is not to teach you about something you don't know. Some of you, a lot of what we talk about is gonna be very new today. For some of you, it may be very familiar. But the goal this morning is to focus on God's word, how to study it, and how to apply it. So look back with me at verses 16 through 17. Paul writes that all scripture is God-breathing and is useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting. So if we want scripture, God's word, to transform our lives, we need to be able to understand what it means. Now, we often refer to this in the church as interpretation of scripture. And so the reason we need to do this is that when we're studying scripture, we're reading literature that is thousands of years old. And so for us, we have to work to understand the original meaning that the author intended and not just take general guesses as to what we think it means. And so what I want to do with you this morning is give you some steps that you can take to practically learn to study the Bible. And so I'll give you a little bit of heads up. If you're a note taker, be a lot of different slides and things you want to write down. If you miss a slide, take a picture of it, or there's a good shot it's going to come back up at some point with some extra stuff on it, so don't worry. If you're not a note taker, this is probably the first time I'll tell you I would encourage you to take notes because there's hopefully going to be a lot of very useful stuff for you this morning and maybe even some resources that you can use to study that you didn't know about. So the first step to studying the Bible is to study the information. And we're going to break that down just a little bit because when it comes to studying the information and studying the Bible, there are actually five types of information that are important and necessary to understand what the Bible is talking about. And the first of these is author and audience. It's important for us to understand who wrote a book and who they wrote it to. And the reason for this is, is that we can actually look at the content of a book and begin to understand why it's written the way it is based on who it's written to. And so a really good example of this is found in the Gospels. If you're studying the Gospels, you may know that all four Gospels, right, they serve the exact same purpose of helping to teach you to learn about God's or Jesus's life and ministry, right? All four serve the exact same purpose, but every single one of the Gospels are different from the others. And they all have different things within them. And so, for example, the book of Matthew is actually written to a Jewish audience. And so if you read the book of Matthew, you'll notice that it does things like include the lineage of Jesus, that he's from the line of David. But it will also do things like refer to the kingdom of God as the kingdom of heaven. It's the only gospel to do that. And the reason for that is, is that for a Jewish audience, the name of God was so sacred to them and held in such high revere that they would not say the name of God out loud. And so they made a simple change to make that easier for them to understand and a little bit more culturally acceptable. But if you look at the book of Mark, totally different book. The book of Mark is the shortest gospel by far. And you'll notice within that book that it's very quick. It's very active. And the reason for this is, is that Mark wrote the book of Mark to Romans. And so when he wrote this book, Romans would not have cared anything about Jesus' lineage or really any of that extra stuff. And so it was very important when writing to them that he got right to the heart of what Jesus' ministry was. He's very quick and to the point, and that was good for them because that's all they needed to know. Now, the next type of information is tied directly to this, and it is historical and cultural context. So as you're studying and you learn who a book is written to, the next step is then to understand and research what happened in the moments around writing this book. So when that book was written, what was going on in that culture and what, did, what was happening, what was good, what was bad, all of these things are important. And the reason for this is, is that what was happening in that culture 
directly influences how you interpret scripture because the books of the Bible are written for very specific purposes. And when we can understand who it's written to and understand what was happening during that time, it helps to inform what's going on and help inform the context of what we're reading. A good example of this can be found in the book of Romans. In Romans 1.16, you find probably one of the most popular verses in the Bible. It says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Many of you probably know this verse, and you probably, when you read this verse, you think about boldness for Jesus, right? It is the anthem for standing up in a dark world because we are bold for the gospel. And while this verse does talk about and mean that there is boldness in Jesus, it has a more specific connotation than just a broad boldness for Jesus. When Paul wrote the book of Romans, he was writing to a church that was very divisive. It was full of Jewish and non-Jewish or Gentile Christians, and they were button heads pretty bad. They were fighting, and the main reason was that Jewish Christians were trying to hold a stance of superiority, right? They're the original, the OG, they're God's people, and so they were telling Jew or Gentile Christians, they were saying, look, if you want to be a follower of Christ, you're going to have to keep all of our customs and laws, and so if you want to be saved, you've got to live like a Jew, and Paul, here, he makes an argument against this in Romans 1. He says, that's not true. And he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And why is he not ashamed? He says, because it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, yes, but then to the Gentile. And so Paul's boldness is in a gospel that is radically inclusive, a gospel that served to break down the social and religious barriers that the Jewish Christians were trying to build. And so while this verse is about boldness in Jesus, it's important to understand it's not necessarily about boldness in the face of persecution, but rather it is that Paul has a confidence and faith in a gospel that is available to everyone no matter who they are. Historical and cultural context matters because it changes the way we interpret the Bible. Now, the next type of information that's important is the genre. You may not realize this, but the books of the Bible are very different from each other. In fact, throughout the books and in, in all of them, you'll find different types of literature and what type of literature a book is can actually directly influence the way that you're supposed to interpret that book. In the Bible, you will find eight different types of literature and genres, and it's narrative, poetry, law, wisdom, prophecy, gospels, epistles, and apocalyptic literature. Every one of these, all throughout the Bible. But within these, some of these are really easy to understand, right? If we can understand the context of letters and who they're written to, they're pretty straightforward. But there are three genres in particular that I would encourage you to be careful how you interpret them. The first of these is law. When you look at books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy and even portions of Exodus, you need to have an understanding that Jewish ceremonial, civil, and criminal laws don't apply to us anymore. That was the old Mosaic covenant. We have a new covenant through Jesus. And so while these verses serve to teach us important principles, right? You can look at the law and see that God takes holiness and being set apart from the world seriously, they don't apply to us anymore. And so the way I would encourage you to study this is look at the historical and cultural context and figure out why certain laws existed. Why did they need to be set apart in that way? And that's a good way to study that as long as you don't think you have to keep that command anymore. When you look at the book of Proverbs, for example, wisdom literature often contains things like Proverbs. And Proverbs are great, right? They are wise, spiritual advice. Many of us know several of them. We can quote them. They sound good. But you need to be careful not to interpret Proverbs as guarantees. Proverbs are meant specifically to be wise and godly advice. They are general guidelines with general results, not promises from God. So interpret them as things that are really good for you to do or really good for you to avoid, but understand they are not promises from God. Now, the third type of literature is one that for most people can be very confusing and very frustrating. And then for some of you, it's very exciting. And that's apocalyptic literature. 
Found in portions of Daniel and all throughout Revelations, apocalyptic literature, it is full of symbolism, prophecy, and figurative language. And it's a genre that requires a deep knowledge of the Old Testament and a knowledge of the kingdoms around during biblical times for you to be able to really understand what's happening and be able to interpret it. But while it's difficult for you to understand, the apocalyptic literature is very good for us to read because it's full of hope, right? It's full of these beautiful and imaginative depictions of different types of divine intervention. Things like Jesus' birth are mentioned in Revelations, but also his triumphant return. And so what I would challenge you with and just encourage you is if you want to try and tackle apocalyptic literature, I would work to grow in your faith and grow in your knowledge of the Bible before you jump into it. But if you want to study it, here's what you can do. Study the historical and cultural context because who it was written to is going to really influence what you're reading. Study the symbolism and understand what the different signs mean and what they were supposed to talk about. And if you'll do that and walk through that, then you'll actually find that apocalyptic literature is full of pretty rich theology, but also a hope for a future with Jesus. Now, for author and audience, historical and cultural context and genre, these three specifically are often referred to as the background information for books. And background information, what's really great for us is there are specific tools available to us to help you study this. Anybody here own a study Bible? couple of you, yeah. If you have a study Bible, you probably know that in the beginning, before a book, there is an introduction section. And that introduction section typically serves to walk through this information right here. But if you don't have that or would like extra ways to look at that, it's not a big deal. There are tons of ways you can learn about background information. And one of those resources is the Blue Letter Bible. Now, this is an online resource. It's free. They even have an app for your phone. And one of the great things about the Blue Letter Bible is before it talks about a book, it'll actually give you multiple different introductions from different scholars. And so you can study as much about the background as you want to. Now, if you're somebody that prefers to have physical copies of things, like you love books and you want to study books and you want a resource that walks you through this, uh, one that I would recommend in particular are two books. It's the Holman Old and New Testament handbooks. And uh, I actually have mine right here. So these are pretty new. And what's great about these is they have the introductions in the book. So they'll walk you through all three of these types of information. But they also do great things like give you maps and talk about like big themes and words that are important all throughout it. And in the Old Testament, it'll even work to connect some of the things with Jesus and show you how the Old Testament and New Testament are connected. And these are really neat because they, they made them to be like coffee table books. And so they, they kind of make them nice and pretty. And even the pages are colorful and illustrated so that you can leave them out on your coffee table and they look nice, but then they're easily accessible for you. So these are pretty cheap. If you, if you want a good resource, I would highly recommend these. Um, but... Studying all of this is important and there are tools available to you. So study the background information. It's very helpful in leading you to an understanding of what scripture is. Now, the next type of information that's important is literary context. So as we're studying scripture and we work through the background information, the next thing we need to be careful of is that we do not take scripture out of context. Scripture, with the exception of certain things like Proverbs, are often written in what are called passages that flow together. And so there is a danger in taking specific verses out of the context of its passage. And really the big thing is that you have the potential to deviate from the original meaning of the scripture. And this is probably the most common mistake that people make when studying the Bible, because there are verses in the Bible that if you pluck them out by themselves, and they are beautiful and encouraging verses, and you've got a shot that it might mean exactly what you think it means, but there are also verses that it can be very confusing and have very deep meanings. And so the danger with isolating Bible verses by themselves is you run the risk of missing the meaning. And so it can become difficult or even impossible to understand a verse without understanding what's happening around it. And so in order to have accurate and informed interpretations of Scripture, I would encourage you to study what's around the verses. So look at what comes before and see what the author is saying leading up to the verses, but then also look at what comes after it and see where they go from there. A really good example of this is found in Jeremiah 29. Verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, many of you in this room know this verse, and for many people, this verse is one of great comfort, right? It's, it's often something that people quote in, in really hard times. 
But it's also a verse that's used to argue for things like the prosperity gospel, this idea that if you're just obedient to God, then he'll give you a life that's blessed and full of health and wealth. And so the question we have to ask is, what does this verse really mean, right? Because those interpretations sound good, but are they correct? So we're going to go backwards and look at the verse right before this and see if that helps us. Verse 10 says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So what's happening here in verse 10 is God is telling the Israelites, he says, look, for 70 years, you're gonna be in exile in Babylon. You're about to be here for a long time. Now, I don't know about you, that's not a good promise, right? But it is a direct result of Israel's disobedience. Early in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah warns Israel. He says, look, God says, if you don't repent, if you don't turn back to him and be obedient, then he will not protect you anymore. And he will allow Babylon to invade and take over. And that is exactly what happens. Israel is disobedient to God continually and he allows Babylon to come in. So they take them over and now the Jews are exiles in Babylon. And so God writes this letter to them. He says, you're gonna be here for a while. In the verses right before verse 10, he actually tells them, he says, look, build your family here, build houses, put roots down, pray for the prosperity of Babylon because this is home now. So how does verse 10 influence verse 11. What shows us that when God is talking about good plans in verse 11, it's not prosperity in the moment. And so what God is saying is that ultimately this exile is for the benefit of Israel. And the reason for that is, is that eventually they will turn back to God, right? And so he says, if they'll turn back to me, I'll keep the promise that I made in the Mosaic covenant to be good to them, to bless them and protect them. But it will only happen when they are in relationship with me. And so God says this exile, it is not to hurt you. It's not to harm you, but ultimately it serves the purpose to give you a hope and a future that if you return and seek me, I'll answer. In verse 12, he says that, he says, look, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And so really, Jeremiah 29, 11, it has nothing to do with us. It is a promise from God that this is not something he did simply to punish Israel. But ultimately in that moment, God's goal was that they would turn back to him and they would lead it back into relationship with him. And so God says, in that, this is my plan for you to have a hope and a future, that you would come back to me. So, this verse, not about us, but we can take good principles from it, right? We can understand that God keeps his promises and God is faithful to his people. But it's incredibly important to understand God's not talking about us right here. So do you see why literary context matters? One line of scripture can completely change the way you interpret a verse. And so it's important as we study, even when things seem surface level or seem easy to understand in the moment, I would challenge you, even then, go back and look at what's around it. Look at what happens before it, what happens after it, because ultimately it can lead you to a deeper and more full meaning or maybe even correct interpretation of scripture. Now, the next type of information, and our last one this morning, is word study. So once you work through the first four of these, right, you've kind of gotten to the meat, the bones of what really is going on in the passage, right? You understand who it's written to, who it's written by, why it's written. You've looked at what's happening around it. And so now the question is, is there anything deeper to glean from this passage? And so you may have specific words that you would like to understand on a better level or see if there is a deeper meaning behind them. And so that's what word study is for. And the best way to study words in the Bible is to actually look at their original languages. Now, there are three Bibles found in the Bible. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and the New Testament, the vast majority of it, is written in what's called Koine Greek. It's a little bit of an older version of Greek. And then there are portions of Aramaic found within it, which was the common language spoken at the time. And so as you're studying words, it's important for us to study the original languages because you may have multiple different words for the same English word that all have really different meanings. And so for example, if you're studying a verse in the New Testament and that verse talks about love, well, there are four different Greek words used in the Bible for love in the New Testament. And so knowing which exact version of love is being talked about 
actually can drastically change the meaning of that verse and how you're supposed to live it out. And so I would encourage you, study the original languages and see what that does for you. Now, some of you are looking at me and you're like, Chris, that sounds great. I am not a Hebrew or Greek scholar. That's okay. The good news for you is that today, you don't even need a degree in this to understand it. I mean, I've had four semesters of Greek in particular, and I can tell you honestly, you guys have more information and knowledge available to you than I had ever had in two years of school. It is way easier for you guys to hop online and understand things more than I did. And so there are tools readily available to you guys to help you walk through word studies and understand original languages. Now, one of those is one we talked about earlier. It's the Blue Letter Bible. So that actually has a study Bible built into it. And within those verses, you can click on words and do word studies throughout them. So it'll show you the original language and talk to you about it. But my preferred way is using what's called an interlinear Bible. Now, what this is, if you go to this website and you search for a a book of the Bible or a chapter of the Bible, it will actually take you line by line walking through the original language. It will give you the Greek or the Hebrew, and then it will give you what it means, a very literal translation, and give you a link to the root word so that you can understand the broader, more original meaning of the word. And so these are really helpful tools for you because they'll teach you what a word is, what it means, and what the context is and what it's written in. And so I will tell you that word studies are not always necessary for studying scripture, right? This is a tool that's useful. It's not always required, but what I would encourage you to do is to give this a try. Study the original languages, see what words mean, and see if it doesn't lead you to a deeper understanding of scripture. Now, when we talk about all five of these types of information here, the reality is most of you in this room are never going to be experts and scholars in all five areas. That's okay. Okay. The good news is there are people who are scholars in all of this. And so like a mechanic working on an old car, it's really helpful to have a trusty set of tools. The same thing's true for us when we're studying the Bible. There are tools available for us to help study the Bible and we call them commentaries. And what commentaries are is they're books written by biblical scholars that will walk detailed through books of the Bible and they'll talk about all five of these things. They'll walk through the context, the backgrounds, help you with the context and literature, and even show you some of the words that are important throughout them. And so these are really, really important and sometimes even necessary for studying scripture. Now, don't freak out and think I'm gonna tell you that you need to buy a $2,000 set of books to study the Bible. You don't have to do that. There are free commentaries for you guys to use. Uh, One of the ones I would recommend is one that Nathan and I talk about pretty frequently. It's Enduring Word Commentary by David Guzik. This is also on Blue Letter Bible, so that same exact website you can find this on. And he does a really, really good job. He will walk pretty detailed through the books of the Bible, and he gives you really great application for them, but also will quote different scholars and show you how they relate to our context. And so very deep, very good theology. And I'll tell you honestly, this is one that Nathan and I use a lot even when we're preaching. And so it's really, really good resource. Um, But if you're somebody here who is adamant, you're like, I would pay for a commentary and I want a good one to use. Uh, One I would recommend is the NIV application commentary. So you can buy these books as a whole set, or you can buy them in the individual books. And these are probably my favorite commentaries, so I'm being honest with you guys. We used them when I was in college for some of my classes, and they just they do a really good job of explaining to you historical context, but they explain to you the culture and how that relates to us, and then they give you long application sections for the entire book of how you can walk through this and apply this to your life. And so I actually have copies of these still to this day. This is my, uh, my copy of the Romans one. So you can see that one book is just the book of Romans. Uh, And so these are very, very detailed books, very, very useful for us walking through. These things will help you learn and know about the Bible in ways that uh, you just didn't even know were possible. Uh, And so they're really cool. And so here's the deal ultimately, is that studying the Bible, I mean, when you walk through it, studying the information is important. These five techniques right here, these are crucial for us to be able to understand God's word and understand it the best ways possible. And so I would challenge you and take these these types of information, take these techniques, use them, study, research, look at how all this applies to scripture. And what I will promise you is, man, if you will do this, it will lead you to a deeper and better understanding of God's word. So study the information. Now, the next step in studying scripture is to pray for wisdom and understanding. Our job when reading scripture is not to decide its meaning. It's to understand its meaning. 
And the challenge with that is there are going to be times where you're going to come across verses that are very difficult to understand. You're going to come across verses you don't agree with. You're going to come across verses that mean entirely different things than you thought they did. And so what I would challenge you in the moments where you find yourself in that place, not to be so stubborn about what you think scripture means, but let God inform you what it means. You know, Paul says that all scripture is useful for what? He says rebuking and correcting. Now that right there will tell you alone, we don't always get this right. Right, Romans eleven thirty three 33 says it this way. It says, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his path beyond tracing out. So that verse right there, I'll tell you, man, God and his word, they are unknowable without him. If God doesn't reveal what it means to us, we're clueless. And so if you wanna know and understand the Bible, but you're trying to do it based on your own understanding, not really gonna work out for you. And so here's what you have to do. Humble yourself before God, Pray that he would reveal this information to you. Pray that he would reveal the meaning of scripture. And so I would challenge and encourage you to pray specifically that the Holy Spirit would reveal the meaning of scripture to you. And so for you, as you study all of the information and as God works to reveal what it means to you, you then now have to submit to what he reveals. The goal is that we understand, not decide. So don't decide what scripture means to you Pray that God would reveal that meaning to you and then submit to it. Now, the last step in studying scripture that we're gonna talk about today is don't just learn it, live it. Scripture does not exist simply to teach us about God, right? It is a great and knowledgeable resource in helping us to understand the mysteries of God. But all of the knowledge about God in the world is useless if we don't use it to inform and change the way we live. Look back at our verses with me in 16 and 17. Paul says, all scripture is God-breathing and useful for training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible does not exist for us to just learn about and be entertained by. The goal of the Bible ultimately is that our lives are completely and drastically changed as a result of it. You know, I've got friends that love the Harry Potter books. Anybody like Harry Potter? My friends have read those books cover to cover more times than I have ever watched the movies, which is impressive. But none of my friends have dropped everything they do to become a wizard. Now, I'm not telling you that some of them don't own wands, because they do, and I am fairly certain, even though they won't tell me, that some of them have robes in their closet. But what I can tell you with confidence is that none of my friends are waiting on their Hogwarts acceptance letter. And some of you are probably thinking, you're like, well, Duh. Hogwarts, not real. Harry Potter, not real. Exactly. There is a big difference in fictional literature that entertains and real scripture that transforms. So why are we so quick to treat scripture like fictional literature? Why would we study this and learn about it and then not apply it to our lives if we believe it to be true and believe it to be the word of God. James uh, says this in James 1.22. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. We cannot believe the lie that all we're supposed to do is learn about God. James says the goal is that we would read his word, but that we would do what it says because this is how we grow as disciples of Jesus. This is what it looks like to live this out. And so my goal for you this morning ultimately really is for you, yes, to grow in knowledge. I mean, I hope that you come to understand scripture in ways that you have never understood it before. And I hope that you come to know God in deeper and more intimate ways than you've ever known him. But more than that, the goal is that we live out his word, that we would study it, that we would meditate, meditate on it and apply it to our lives. And if we'll do that, then we will be transformed by him in the process. You know, as we've studied through the Bible, you'll often hear Nathan refer to this equation when we talk about this as information plus application equals transformation. And if we're being honest with you, man, that's the goal. Like we're not here to make scholars. We're here to make disciples. And so the goal with, our, with teaching you is not really just that you would learn about God, but more than that, we hope that you would apply God's word to your life, that you would know his word, but that you would live it out and be changed by it. Because this is what it looks like. 
And so my challenge to you this morning is don't just learn it, but live it. Consider what God's word teaches you, submit to it, and let it change your life. You know, over the past year, I have been working on my car and we've come a long way, y'all. But I will tell you, it's not done yet. Still a work in progress. My wife and I lovingly refer to my car as Bertha because she ain't pretty, but she's reliable. That car has become a labor of love for me. I could, you know, I went from being able to tell you nothing about that car to knowing more facts about it than anybody could humanly possibly care to know. But all that information, all the articles I read, all the videos, all the diagrams, all this research, man, it was useless if I didn't do anything with it. And so I had to take the knowledge and I had to apply it. And I had to use it to get my car to run better every day. Studying the Bible is the same thing. All the knowledge in the world about God and his word, it doesn't matter one bit if it doesn't change your life. And so the goal this morning is not simply just to learn about God and his word, but to let his word transform your life as you live in response to it. You know, this morning, I, earlier you got to see Nath, or, uh, Tristan's video and, and this is what it looks like. I'll tell you my favorite thing about Tristan in his video is that he is so new to this. I don't know if y'all realize it, but the dude's been a follower of Christ for like two years. And even in that two years, he's really been taking this journey of discipleship seriously for a little over six months now. And man, if you knew Tristan six months ago to Tristan today, totally different person. That dude has come out of his shell. I mean, he's serving in different ways. Just a couple of weeks ago, he preached to our Hearts for Heroes veterans at their Bible study. Yeah. And what I love about Tristan's story is, yes, I mean, he is studying God's word in, in just crazy ways. The dude has challenged himself right now. He's working through the gospels and the book of Job, because why not? You know, and he asks all kinds of crazy questions that we even sometimes struggle to understand for him. I mean, he is trying his best to understand the depths of who God is and what his word teaches. But more than that, Tristan is learning and applying it to his life. And because of that, God is changing his life. See, it's information plus application that equals transformation. And so this same change that you see in Tristan, it's the same change possible in your life. And so what I will promise you today is that if you'll do this, man, if you will study God's word, right? Study the information, pray for wisdom and understanding, and then live it out. It will change everything about you. So this morning, don't just learn it, live it, and let God radically change your life. Let's pray.